Yeah, that's a good idea. Feel free to occupy the closer seats. These are very nice people. <laughs> Goodness sakes, it's exactly three o'clock. We're all sitting so quietly. I guess we might as well start. Um, welcome to the Wilson Center. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the Wilson Center, uh, very quickly, it was established by an act of Congress in 1968 as a memorial to, of course, uh, President Woodrow Wilson, who put a great emphasis in his career on bridging the gap, the tremendous gap, between scholarship and policymaking and politics. So that's one of the underlying principles and aims of the center in all of its activities. Today, let me give you a brief introduction to uh, our topic and why we thought it would be a very worthwhile one to pursue. The, uh, this is actually the third in a series uh, called, uh, of forums that we've called What Really Works in Preventing uh, Conflict and uh, Rebuilding uh, States. Uh, it's born out of a conviction that a lot of forums are held in Washington in which one or another type of an intervention or approach to conflict is promoted, um, not always with a great deal of evidence as to whether it actually has any consequences and beneficial effects in conflict. So there's a lot of advocacy, but not a hell of, heck of a lot, sorry, I shouldn't use that kind of word, <laughs> in, especially in this forum. Um, uh, uh, not a lot of analysis. Uh, a kind of policy bazaar in which people tout various ideas but are not seem really held accountable to uh, showing the results of uh, the approach that they're promoting in terms of what is really happening on the ground in a particular conflict because after all that's the payoff, that's where the payoff has to come. It's not what we think or we, what we believe, what we hope, what we intend, but actually what are the results. Uh, recently there's been a lot of attention to uh, how to actually measure impacts of various approaches to conflict. There's a whole uh, methodology called peace and conflict impact assessment. If you're interested in knowing about the tools and approaches and methods involved in that, all you have to do is uh, click on right in, into Google peace and conflict impact assessment and instantaneously you will see 10 or 12 references, 10 or 12 tools that develop a methodology for as assessing whether this or that program, development program, peace building program, conflict resolution program is actually having an effect, a sort of way of, of studying and assessing impacts. There's also a consciousness that in the field which, I, uh, which actually has been going now for 10 or 15 years since the post-Cold War era ended, or during the post-Cold War, War era, in which uh, a lot of knowledge has been gathered about the causes of conflict, an awful lot of different activities have been funded by various organizations such as USAID, the UN, and, and so on. And the sense that while all of them may make some sort of contribution, it's not clear what they all add up to. So we need to develop some, a better strategic sense of what mixes and combinations of uh, approaches may actually make a difference on the ground to the people who are actually suffering and dying as a result of conflict. Uh, and that some mix of carrots and sticks and other, other approaches, re relationship building, institution building, uh, is, is needed in most cases to really show uh, changes in, in, this, in, a situ in a conflict situation. So this is the uh, impetus behind this series and we've looked at a couple different approaches so far and today uh, we're um, looking at some, uh, a, a theme, a subject that has gotten an awful lot of attention uh, in recent years having to do with the, the role and value of religious ideals, beliefs, uh, uh, sentiments, uh, principles and so on as well as actual uh, figures, uh, leaders in the world of religion, spiritual leaders and so on and their uh, positive impacts on uh, on conflict, either in mitigating the sources of conflict or in strengthening the capacities for dealing with it. So we're not, I know some of you might be disappointed, but we're not particularly focusing here on religion 
as a cause of conflict, but rather religion as a potential uh, ameliorator of, of conflict. So what we did is we asked the panel, whom I'll introduce uh, in a minute, uh, this question. What kinds of evidence can you cite that demonstrates the, that the involvement of religious leaders or religion in some form has had a concrete impact on the prevention, mitigation, or resolution of specific conflicts? Have they, for example, how would you measure that? Have they successfully helped to mediate specific conflicts? Have they influenced the political process affecting episodes of crisis or of uh, instances of uh, conflict management, uh, the achievement of a peace settlement, for example? Have they shaped the consciousness of uh, specific religious communities, constituencies that may be on the opposed sides of a conflict? There's various ways one might break down this question of what impact uh, religion has, has had. What would a theory of religious in, uh, strategy, religious, religion as a strategy for dealing with conflict, what would it say as to how it works? What is unique about the value of religion and religious leaders that diplomats, politicians, military people, other elements in civil society uh, don't perhaps have uh, and, and cannot bring to the table uh, in, to uh, address a conflict situation. So that's our basic concern uh, this afternoon. Uh, and we're hoping that we can uh, stimulate a very good conversation uh, both here up at the table and uh, at the panel and, and <coughs> among the members of the audience on that basic question. In a way, you might sum it up as our faith-based approaches to conflict based on faith alone, or is there evidence and reason as well behind the argument? Uh, personally, I grew up in, a, uh, in the Lutheran Church, and uh, Martin Luther, as you know, uh, promoted the idea that we are saved by faith, not works. Um, but he also said things like, <coughs> better a knave than a saint for a prince. So he had a very pragmatic uh, side as well. And when it comes to state, the matters of state and politics, uh, its results, at least that's the way I've come to, in my own personal evolution, to, to think. Um, so with that brief uh, introduction as to the rationale for this, this uh, forum, uh, let me introduce our speakers. We uh, have a very, uh, I would say, probably diverse and very distinguished and experienced group of people to air this subject, explore this subject uh, this afternoon. And I'd like to introduce first um, Joyce Dubinsky, who is the Executive Vice President of the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. Uh, and their center has done, as she will describe, uh, a lot of work on this subject. Uh, you can find the other uh, experience and attributes and distinctions of all of the uh, people up here in, in the bios, uh, rather than take a lot of time to introduce everybody, uh, please look at that, uh, those bios for, for more background. Uh, we've asked everyone to uh, limit themselves to about 10 or 12 minutes so that we can have time at the end for, for discussion. So with that, Joyce, would you please lead us off? Well, first let me say how grateful I am to be here, um, and it's a privilege to be with friends and colleagues. Um, I think it's right that no matter where we're going today, we are hearing um, talk about religion, religious extremism, and there's also talk about where are the moderate voices. Um, and that's really something that we tackle in Tannenbaum. Uh, through programs that help both to prevent and to reduce uh, the conflicts that involve religion. We're a non-sectarian secular organization, and our prevention programs involve training educators and working actually in workplaces to reduce conflicts among religiously diverse staff. Um, when it comes to reducing conflict, uh, our program is our Religion and Conflict Resolution Program, and we focus on how violence can be reduced um, and conflicts uh, by religious actors who are using religion 
uh, if you will, constructively for peace. Um, this program is premised on the assumption that there are uh, religious voices of moderation who are doing effective work in these areas. And what we did was to set out to document um, and to find the people that we call peacemakers in action. We started with criteria um, so that we would say who we were looking for. We're looking for religiously motivated individuals, not necessarily clergy, but people who are driven by their religious beliefs, uh, working in areas of armed conflict, um, doing work that includes work at the grassroots level, although maybe not exclusively at the grassroots. Um, when we look for them, we look for people who are relatively unrecognized. Over time, some of the people that we've identified probably are now known to you but many of them, when we identified them, would not have been. And looking um, for people whose lives or freedom have been put at risk by the work that they do. So we're really looking for the unsung heroes, the individuals on the ground whose religion motivates them to try to overcome conflict. Every year we select two peacemakers uh, through our Peacemakers in Action program and um, our um, Middle East North Africa Women's Peace Initiative. And today we have 24 of them, including Betty, who is one of our newest peacemakers. And um, our peacemakers work at all levels of conflict. Uh, they work to prevent it. They work to mitigate it. They work to resolve it. And some of them are working now in post-conflict situations. Uh, what we're looking at are not the people necessarily who are getting the paper piece and who are getting the settlements, although sometimes they're involved in that, but much more so the track two diplomats, uh, the people working on the ground. Um, our work with uh, the Tannenbaum peacemakers is on two tracks. In one, we train them, we collaborate with them, and we're working now to build a network with them uh, that we hope will have even greater power than we've had up until now. Um, we have working retreats. Our last one was in Sarajevo, and I'm not going to talk about it now, but if you're interested in learning more, just give me your card and we'll get you some information or talk to my colleagues uh, in the back of the room, uh, Shahrazad and Heather, who uh, run in the uh, Religion and Conflict Resolution Program, Shahrazad Jafari, Heather Dubois. Can you raise your hands, guys, so they know who you are? Okay. Uh, the second track of our work is um, really studying the work of our peacemakers, and we do in-depth case studies. We do intensive interviews with them. We do research um, about them, uh, and we research the conflicts in which they are involved. And then we analyze the techniques that they use. So. Uh, we have this book, which is the first of our findings. Uh, it includes the case studies of 16 of our peacemakers. It's called Peacemakers in Action, Profiles of Religion and Conflict Resolution. And it was edited um, by Dr. David Little of Harvard Divinity School and published by Cambridge University Press about a year ago. And um, through our analysis, we both tell their stories of how religion motivates them and how they use it, but also analyze their techniques, which though unique, are also replicable, and so others can learn from them. And our findings, and I'll talk about three of our peacemakers briefly, um, are that they do have an impact. So the first person I'd like to share a little bit about with you is Ephraim Isaac. Um, I, you may have read something about him recently. Ephraim is an Ethiopian, uh, a Yemenite Jew. I believe he speaks 17 languages at this point, um, and I would call him a track two diplomat. Uh, and his work is really very much intervening in and trying to prevent conflicts in Ethiopia, although his home base is in the U.S. He's there a great deal of the time. Um, I guess it was May 2005 when in Ethiopia there were elections um, that were challenged as rigged and um, as just replete with fraud. 
and the result was a lot of violent protests. Over 200 people were killed, and um, over a thousand people in the opposition were jailed. Um, many of the leaders were jailed for life. Um, Ephraim immediately went into action to mobilize to try to resolve the tensions that were resulting in, in his country. And I remember just a little bit because we had a retreat a few months after that at which he was present and he was constantly running out and grabbing his phone and um, saying, I can't talk to you now <laughs> because I have a crisis. I've got to go talk to them. And he showed me a letter from the president um, of the country and, you know, of Ethiopia may have been the Prime Minister, and he said, you see what this says? And the letter said they're planning a protest march and they're going to put women and children in the front so that we won't shoot. Ephraim, you need to know we're going to shoot if they have this march in two days. And so he was spending his, he was up all night when they were awake trying to resolve this and work on it. But what he also did, um, and where he got his credibility, he's recognized as an elder in that community and he convened a council of the elders from around the country. Um, these are traditional leaders uh, in, in the local community, sometimes religious, sometimes not, um, appreciated for their wisdom and their spirit of forgiveness, and they have a lot of credibility in the community. And he, as their leader, working with this council of elders, essentially did shuttle diplomacy back and forth between the jails and the opposition leaders and the, um, and the prime minister. And it was Ephraim and this council, not the pressure of the international community, that ultimately resolved this crisis very recently. 38 of the opposition leaders were released, and they issued an apology, taking some responsibility for the violent protests that had followed. As a result of that, they were allowed back into po you know, political life. And so, rather than spending their lives in prison and with the tensions continuing to escalate through this back-channel quiet diplomacy by religious leaders, uh, mobilizing religious and community leaders, they were able to reduce the tensions. This isn't the only time that Ephraim has drawn on this indigenous practice in Ethiopia uh, in order to resolve conflict. Um, during the Ethiopian Civil War, he um, worked with the Council of Elders and um, likewise um, worked with um, them. I just got the two-minute sign. I'm going, wow. Uh, <laughs> with um, uh, other conflicts afterward. Uh, his motivation is his Judaism and also the spiritual forgiveness tradition of his community. Sakina Yakubi, um, from Afghanistan, a Muslim woman, worked during the time of the Taliban to work with women. She, he taught, she taught them literacy, but she taught them through the Quran, and she had credibility as a religious woman teaching scripture. And through the Quran, she taught them human rights, peace education, and that women were to be respected. And then she worked with them on how to take these teachings and these religious lessons back to their homes, to the men and their families, because this was very counter to what the Taliban uh, were doing. And in this, I think, she was really affecting the consciousness of the entire community and helping to establish um, the groundwork where there could be a more stable society. Today she reaches 350,000 women and children, and she's still working, always at risk, still at risk, or more risk again. Uh, she now has to change cars every day because it's not safe for her to be in the same car two days in a row. They know where to find her. Um, I think one of the things about Sakina's work is that she is reaching those who others can't reach. And again, she works in a range of levels of conflict, both in prevention and mitigation and trying to build a stable peace. Uh, Friar Ivo Markovich um, had a very dramatic story. He's a Franciscan um, uh, friar from uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, and during the 90s when the war struck, he suffered personal losses that were really quite extraordinary. He got a call while doing peace work that his father and uncle had been murdered and his home destroyed. 
And he talks about how he went into the depths of depression and thought about how if he had been there, he could have done something. He could have fought back. And then he decided, no, that was not what he would do. And his religion actually pushed him to say, I'm going to stay and be committed to peace work. And so he went back and did that. And there was many ways in which he did it. But one very striking story is when um, there was about to be a battle um, between the two sides, and they were on opposite sides of a field. And Evo, um, in full dress, for, um, for, went walking through the two, and they, they were armed. And, and, and he was going to a Muslim village, and someone you know, pointed a gun at him, and he said, you know, stop or I'll shoot. And he said, what, you know, shoot me, you idiot? And he kept going. And he went into the village, and he found the imam, and he talked with the imam, and he said, we have to stop this craziness. And these two religious leaders went out, and each spoke to the uh, commanders of the different militia. And they got them to agree that day not to fight. And that day, no one was killed. Um, for me, he's a hero, a, a hero because he overcame the personal losses that can turn someone from peace, and also because of this, this and these other acts that he does. He continues to work in post-conflict today, trying to build understanding and peace. Um, these are just three very quick examples, and um, when we analyzed the work of the peacemakers in this book, what we found was that Many of the techniques they use, whether they're in West Papua or in um, El Salvador, are the same. And therefore, they can be replicated and people can be trained to do them. So while unique to these religious peacemakers, they're also replicable and can be, we can learn from them. Many use religious text, like Sakina, although in a range of different ways. She used it to teach human rights. Um, uh, Chen Shou Alas uses it to teach a love of the environment and a responsibility to protect the environment. Um, many work with indigenous traditions and figure out how to apply it for peacemaking. Uh, and several work to create zones of peace. We've analyzed at Tannenbaum the uh, sources of their effectiveness. And what we have found is that Part of what makes these religious leaders effective is the fact that religion so permeates their lives and it is part of what moves them to act and very often is a tool upon which they draw. Uh, they remain in their communities. They're known as being connected to their communities. They're not zooming in and out. They're not coming just for two years and then leaving. <coughs> They're authentic and fair. Um, and they have a perceived authority, in part because of their stature as religious leaders. They also have some common personal qualities, which for me were very powerful and I think do hold for all the new peacemakers that we've met as well. Uh, essentially, and, and when they look at another person, what they see is the humanity in that person. And, and th when they see an injustice, they find it, re they can't separate from it. it, it they, their emotional intelligence is extraordinarily high. Their empathy and their capacity for experiencing the pain of the other is extraordinary. But unlike a lot of people who run from the horrible and the pain, they run to it feeling that they've got to do something to stop the injustice. And it's like, it's a compulsion. And I think that's what helps them to overcome the challenges and the difficulty of the work, and, you know, and also the, the incredible loneliness that goes along with it. Um, I would say that almost to a person, and some are extroverts and some are introverts, I mean, they're not the same human being by any means, and you'll get to know Betty and, um, you know, she's just one of, of our peacemakers, but what, there, there is a personal drive and a loneliness that comes with this work and this commitment uh, that drives them, and I think drives them for a lifetime. I think when you find a religious peacemaker, and I 
caution you that not every person motivated by religion and not every religious leader is a religious peacemaker or even a potential religious peacemaker. But when you find the true religious peacemakers, um, they are people that we can learn from and people with whom it's very important for our diplomats and our government officials to work so that we can use them as a resource and a tool for creating peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. That really gets us started very nicely. Uh, we'll turn now to David Smock, who's uh, Vice President at the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, and is the um, uh, director, uh, I guess you, the title is Vice President, uh, but in charge of, in any case, the uh, Center for Mediation and Conflict Resolution um, and the Associate Vice President of the, in, of the program called Religion and Peacemaking. Please, David. Thank you. Uh, since the Tannenbaum Center is co-sponsoring this uh, meeting today, I thought I would focus my remarks on their peacemakers in action that I have worked with and know about. And I will give a little vignette of some of these peacemakers and then draw a lesson from their experience that I think is applicable more widely. Uh, Pastor James Uwe and Imam Ashafa from Muhammad Ashafa from Nigeria have been partners of our from of the Institute of Mind for the last four years, and uh, we work closely with them on a range of projects. But probably the most informative and dramatic was uh, when we went to Yelwa in Plateau State in Nigeria uh, three years ago where a thousand people had been killed, mostly Christians killing Muslims, but also Muslims killing Christians. And in the course of a week, they, I was observing and kibitzing around the edges, but they mediated a peace settlement in Yelwa that has held since then. And police were ringing our mediation efforts because of fear that violence would break out again. Uh, but they use their particular methodology and techniques to mediate this peace agreement. And one of the things that I have learned from James and Ashafa is the value of combining Nigerian peacemaking methodologies with Western conflict resolution methodologies with religious exhortation and religious sensitivities. Probably my most memorable uh, memory of that time with them in Yelwa was when Ashafa would quote from the Bible and James would quote from the Quran in exhorting uh, the people of Yelwa to make peace and to live together. And the emphasis on forgiveness, I think time and again you'll see that in religious peacemaking the emphasis on, religion, on forgiveness is uh, one of the hallmarks. Rabbi Menachem Froman from Israel, chief rabbi of the Tekoa Settlement in the West Bank, is another peacemaker in action. Um, Mark Open, who is here, introduced me to Menachem first. And there are many stories to be told about this eccentric but effective peacemaker. When Sheikh Yassin, the spiritual leader of Hamas, was in prison in Israel, um, Menachem visited him many times, and they established a bond which was based on their shared religiosity, one to Judaism, the other to Islam. But they felt a common bond because they were both people of faith and people of the book. More recently, uh, Menachem has been in touch with the Hamas leadership in Gaza and offered to be a communication channel between the Israeli government and uh, the Hamas leadership because he's been able to form a bond with the Hamas leadership more recently an offer that the Israeli government has not taken up. I think Mark Open will, would be able to share with you also his work in, in Syria and the shared bond that he has found across lines of religious division by the fact of a commitment to a faith tradition. Almost three years ago now, we co-hosted with Catholic University and with um, the International Center for Religion and Democracy a visit by 
nine religious leaders from Iran. And there were seven Muslims, there was one Christian, there was one Jew in the delegation. And we tried to arrange a meeting with members of Congress, and the Iranians said, we, we will not go to a government office in Washington. We don't want any part of it. So we arranged a meeting at the National Prayer Breakfast building on Capitol Hill and happened to invite nine members of Congress to come and meet with them. They were delighted to meet with members of Congress at the National Prayer Breakfast building, as long as it was a religious context and they felt that the members of Congress were there as religious people. They were prepared to discuss all the political issues that divided the U.S. and Iran. But because it was a religious context, it was, they felt permissible to do so. More recently in our work in Afghanistan, we found that working with the ulama there, they have felt that Western uh, participants in the reconstruction of Afghanistan have failed to understand the religiosity, the role of religious leaders, and always want to do everything in a secular context. And when we came and we said, we want to work with you as religious leaders, recognizing your religious stature and importance, they felt this was a first. <coughs> they have been so responsive to this because we recognized their religiosity and respected that. Azar Hussein, who was another uh, peacemaker in action, although too recently to be included in the book from the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy, is somebody that we have worked with particularly in, in Pakistan. Um, we have worked in Aceh and in Indonesia and Pakistan and more recently in, in Afghanistan in working with ulama and with uh, in their work with madrasas in introducing new curriculum materials peace studies materials, emphasizing peace, tolerance, pluralism. And we have recognized in all these places we have worked the, the enormous hunger on the part of madrasa administrators and the madrasa students for new materials, enlightened materials, peacemaking materials. Madrasas are so typically written off as hotbeds of radicalism, and there certainly are those madrasas that are teaching radicalism but there are also so many that are so hunger, hungry for new materials that teach peace and tolerance and pluralism. Canon Andrew White, a Anglican, uh, uh, Anglican priest from the UK, again too recent to be included in the Peacemakers in Action, but we work with Andrew both in Israel-Palestine and currently particularly in Iraq. He's running a conference in in Cairo right now. He ran a conference in Copenhagen uh, about two or three weeks ago, bringing together Shiite, Sunni, Christians, other religious minorities from Iraq. And in Cairo right now, the Sunnis and Shias are preparing fatwas that can be issued by their highest uh, clerics to uh, emphasize the need for peace, to condemn killing, intersectarian killing, and who knows what kind of an impact this will have in Iraq. But the fact that religious leaders from both uh, sides of the uh, particular religious conflict in, in Iraq will meet together and work together for common statements with the authority behind them of, of fatwas to promote peace is a significant accomplishment. San Egidio, their work in Mozambique is probably the most frequently cited example of religious peacemaking. I've taken away several lessons from the work of San Egidio in Mozambique. And the main one, the two that I take away are related. One, that religious leaders, if, they, if religious leaders are working on a national and an international level, that they're not very good at making peace by themselves. They need to collaborate with secular, political, peacemakers and with international organizations. Where religious organizations are particularly good is bringing people together. People who have been unwilling to meet together prior to that get together. San Egidio did that with Renamu and the Mozambique government. Um, the Lutherans and the Catholic Church did that in Guatemala. In both cases, the UN got involved, the State Department got involved, uh, and were 
probably the more important players in actually mediating the peace agreements. But it was the religious communities that were able to initiate the process and bring the parties together where nobody else had been able to do so. A second lesson from, and a related lesson from Santa Jedi on Mozambique was that they knew what they didn't know. They knew how to bring people together. They didn't know how to negotiate a disarmament process and a ceasefire, and they, needed, they knew they needed to turn to military experts to do that. And that's a lesson I think that's helpful for religious peacemaking generally, is to know what we don't know and to turn to others to help out. This book and the work of Tannenbaum emphasizes the role of the individual, of the individual peacemaker, and that's an important lesson. But we also need to keep in mind the importance of religious institutions mm -hmm. and the role that individuals play uh, in an institutional context, and particularly the role that local partners, institutional partners play in enabling peace to take place. The final story I'll tell is about um, Saudi Arabia, where um, three years ago uh, I was approached by the Saudi embassy and asked to uh, organize a week-long visit by five Saudi scholars. And I said I would be willing to do that on one condition, that I have complete control over who they meet with and what the agendas are. And the Saudi embassy said, fine. So I arranged a day-long meeting with American Muslim intellectuals, a day-long meeting with Christian leaders, a day-long meeting with Jewish leaders that Mark Open really put together, and other meetings here. The meetings with the Muslims and the Christians were of moderate interest and importance, but the Christians and the Muslims spent so long trying to establish their shared humanity with the Saudis that uh, we really didn't get to the hard issues. The Jewish participants had no difficulty of getting to the hard issues. And the conversation got to the basics and with civility and respect from both sides and with Marx uh, helping to guide the discussion, um, we talked about anti-Semitism, we talked about Islamophobia, we talked about whether Saudis can criticize the Israeli government policies without being anti-Semitic. The Jewish participants asked whether the Saudis would be prepared to accept the existence of a Jewish state in the Middle East. And um, it was an eye-opening experience for me and helped me to recognize that often the most contentious issues in what look like maybe possibly the most volatile situations can turn out to be the most productive. Thank you, David. Uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce Betty Bagombi, who is a fellow here uh, currently at the Wilson Center in the Africa program. Um, she has the title of Distinguished Fellow and also was named by the Tannenbaum Center as a 2007 peacemaker in action. Uh, again, please uh, look at the uh, rest of her biography for all of her accomplishments uh, in politics and policy and conflict over the years. Betty. Thank you. Um, I've been asked to talk about my experience uh, and how religion uh, influenced me or, um, yeah, it basically influenced me to carry out my work. So I'll talk about my fears, uh, moments of doubt, and moments, last moment when I called upon God. Then I'll talk about the group of rebels that I was dealing with, because the Lord's Resistance Army uh, in northern Uganda, and uh, several other, and there were two, there were several factions, but there were five factions fighting the government to overthrow the government, and two of the two of the five were religious fanatics. So I'll talk of how the influence. Um, they have on their followers, or in the case of the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, the children they abducted turned into killing machines, but at the same time, they totally believed the leader, the leadership had direct contact with God. Then I will also talk about how religious leaders came together, 
and how sometimes we look at them as superhuman beings, where I was able to witness their fears and how they work. But at, on, the, on, on, on the one hand, I also talk about how when different religious interfaith groups get together, the strong message it sends out to their various followers of, uh, you, you know, you're one people. The suffering is the same. And uh, it brings that uh, unity, which is unusual, or shared vision, which people in times of difficulty uh, usually have doubts and suspicion among themselves. Then um, I'll talk about the importance of um, religion, in particular in reconciliation uh, or forgiveness, and in my opinion or in my uh, experience, I believe that uh, this is a comparative advantage they have in working with the community and encouraging uh, reconciliation um, or forgiveness, if you will. So. Uh, in my personal experience, I do not consider myself born again. I consider myself uh, an ordinary Christian who has strong beliefs. So I remember when I was told I was going to move to the conflict area, live there, and try to end the war by peaceful means. And how fear sat in that, and I prayed that uh, the president would forget this and not send me out there. And I thought, why me? I'm a woman. And not only me who had doubts about myself, but the rebels immediately reacted that it was a big insult to send a woman to them. Um, I, so to a point that when I was first going, I even pleaded that I had small children. I was trying to get every uh, reason possible to get away from this. And it was only after some prayers that I told myself many people had died. And if you can go in and save lives, it would have been worth, worth your while. And, uh, it, and it was only after that moment in time that I got calm and got ready to face the challenges uh, of going to live in a war zone without any experience in, uh, without any experience in dealing with war situations. Um, uh, throughout the process of trying to end the conflict, the movements I had, I had to move to the camps where people were, in, uh, internally displaced camps, where people in, were living in squalid situations, where I had to stay with them. And these journeys were never easy. These journeys were on non-existent roads. Going there, you knew very well there could be an ambush. Going there, I knew, uh, well, uh, at least on one occasion, landmines that had been planted for me uh, blew up uh, people who were just immediately ahead of me. And, uh, and moving into these cars went from, from a town to possibly into the camps uh, where you are a group of people. And, uh, from the time you go, you go through towns, and then uh, all you see is destruction, bushes, what used to be schools or buildings or villages, and it is at that moment that you know anything can happen. It is at that moment that I, I've never, exp I've never. It is very difficult to, to describe the silence that befall all of you, that nobody, you, you're many, but how alone you feel at that moment in time. That, uh, that it's so true, the saying of it's um, every man for himself and good for us all. Because you know that if there's any ambush, uh, even uh, people who are designated to be your bodyguard will first take care of their own safety before they can try to uh, protect you. Uh, so these are moments that it really is with God. You feel how helpless you are when you're leaving the troops behind and you're moving into this jungle without knowing what is, uh, what you, you, what you're going to, to face. 
so it it's a personal experience that it's always uh it, it's it's that moment in time uh even if you're a church dropout that you call upon god that it's only you now i'm in your hands nothing else nobody else can save me from this situation but i also remember vividly how you come how it you come down after saying these prayers quietly um so having so the personal experiences it was not only uh, the physical danger of moving on the ground it also involved crashes uh cr crashing in helicopters which are never serviced and uh so i became a very strong believer in uh in that if god does not call your number you do not necessarily go and if he wants you to do something you have a mission you have a calling from him it can happen because it's not very easy often times to reach and be able to talk face to face with um, the most brutal uh, rebel groups like uh, I was faced with the Lord's Resistance Army. Now, I said in my second point, I'll talk of how I also saw the Lord's Resistance Army manipulated people using religion. Uh, most of his uh, followers were children who were abducted and turned into killing machines. And this, I saw, I talked to them and saw how they transformed from being innocent children into becoming killers, where it was to kill or to exhibit brutality. That's how you earned a position. That's how you were given food. That's how you were given clothes and ultimately rewarded with one of the, some of the girls who were abducted as sex slaves. So uh, they exhibited brutality um, because that's, that's, their, that's their way of life. But in all this, Conch says he has 12 spirits, 12 spirits which Chinese, an American who is called King Bruce, uh, who is in charge of intelligence, he's smart enough to think of intelligence. And they've explained to me how he receives communication from him. But what is very puzzling about all this is that the belief these people have in him as somebody who has divine power, irrespective of all the brutality that uh, he exhibits. Talking to them thousands of miles away from Kony, they believe he's listening to them. And if you look at d various rebel groups, where uh, especially the rebel movements that have lasted many years, that there are usually factions. They break up, they split up into groups. But this man in his craziness and brutality, using religion, has never had any challenges from his followers because they believe he, will, he would read their minds. And, and so they dare not challenge him or question anything um, he does. Sometimes I've asked he, um, his commanders or even the children around him that why do you why does why do you totally believe he has this supernatural power and yet at the same time you are told to go and kill in the most brutal manner or to maim people before they are killed and they said well it is fear it's so through using religion he um uh, uh, these children in particular, or even all the commanders, totally follow and obey what uh, he says without questioning or challenging. Then I'll come to my uh, third point on the role of religious leaders in, uh, um, in conflict resolution. First of all, um, I want to say that for a long time, when I was young, especially before I got involved in this, I thought religious leaders are also supermen. Uh, they have no fears. It was only at the time that I eventually agreed to meet with the rebel leader to go into the bush and uh, meet with him. And my question was, 
uh, who do I take? Whose lives do I want? Whose life do I want to risk, knowing how uh, dangerous uh, these peop these rebels are? So I thought, well, since he's got this religious fanaticism, I'll ask religious leaders to go with me. And the rebel had said, come only with six people not armed. The choice was mine as to who I went with, as long as they were not soldiers and they were not armed. So naturally I thought, well, he probably would not want to kill religious leaders. So I asked religious leaders to go with me for the first meeting. Um, at that time, it was I went to uh, the Anglican bishop, I went to the Catholic bishop, and went to the uh, the Muslim leader, uh, a sheikh. Uh, when I went to have them, when I organized to have them picked up at about um, two in the morning, because we were setting off on our journey on this non-existent road at about four in the morning, uh, one certainly developed diarrhea. Another one developed uh, uh, malaria. The other one said, God is with you, we'll pray for you, it is time peace comes. <laughs> then I realized that we are all actually human beings. They're just it's in times of difficulty and uh, danger. Uh, they have exactly the same fear as, as we do. But having said that, the coming together of religious leaders to try to support peace process and um, sent a very strong message uh, to the people. Uh, as I said earlier on, when war is taking place, people are very despondent. There's moral degeneration and you have conflicts within conflict. When people are fighting one another over little space, over to, in order to, when they line up to get water, they're fighting because these are long lines. But and a lot, and it's very easy, therefore, to divide people, to um, on either religious grounds or tribal or whatever else. Now, the coming of religious leaders, uh, what you call a truly relig religious leaders, peace initiative together sent a strong message to the people and they started they stopped looking at one another in uh, uh, from different lenses um, and therefore um, in especially in times of real difficulty when you had thousands of children walk miles to look for security uh, religious leaders stood by them by their side all of them with one voice got together and try to pro uh, provide protection. Not only that, it's also the, the warring factions also listen to them uh, much. They're more effective and more um, easier to 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 in. It's, it's easier for them to influence people because it is believed they have no political agenda. Their interest is to bring that peace. So. Uh, I saw that it worked, it made a huge difference, uh, so, so that people in difficulties always went to religious leaders, and in respect of which faith, uh, to them they were religious leaders and they wanted to talk to, to, to them. Then it comes the challenge of uh, reconciliation. Both while the war is going on, and uh, now, especially now, as um, uh, peace is imminent. Um, this is a very complex situation where a child has been abducted from uh, from a village or a community and told to go back and kill either member of his community or member of his own family. Uh, this is a situation where uh, girls are abducted, turned into wives, and so many of them uh, young, as young as 14, have come back with children. Uh, this is a situation where uh, my son killed your, you killed your husband and sons, and we are in the same within the same community, and they are trying to come back. This is also a situation where the rebels went to other tribes, neighboring tribes, abducted, killed, raped, and maimed body parts. Uh, this is also a situation where government troops um, also unleashed 
uh, atrocities against the innocent population they are supposed to protect. And as peace is looming, um, uh, they, there are very, very many challenges. The girl child has been sent away from the family because they have, uh, because the family is ashamed of the children's killers around, the, uh, around their homes. The community is talking about them. Uh, the boy cannot go, the boy who came back and killed cannot go home. Um, so within the families, uh, you have problems that acceptance of the former combatants and acceptance of the, the girl child. Uh, you have acceptance within the community themselves. There's a lot of finger pointing at one another for what has happened. Recently, when I was in Uganda, uh, I was being told some people do not want to leave the camps because they made enemies within the camps and they fear that if they go back there might be some revenge. So, uh, but in all this, religious leaders still have a lot of influence because they live with the community. Uh, and they have, during conflict, tried to unite them and try to, to talk to them or even to provide counseling. But the challenge is, as peace comes on, to a large extent, it is them to bring, try to bring people together. And I'm talking about uh, a situation where forgiveness is, is very personal. If you butcher my entire family, it is not talking to me about the Bible or who happened. It's how I feel and how I'm approached into um, dealing with the situation or accepting to live with, with that other person. But I saw how in Mozambique, how, um, the religious leaders, especially at the parish level, at the community level, were able to uh, bring people together so that there was no revenge and um, to a large extent, uh, former rebels were not prosecuted. I'm sorry I've taken too long. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Our uh, final speaker is Deborah Schneider from the uh, Department of State. She's the de Deputy Director of the International uh, of the Office on International Religious Freedom. Deborah, please. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Betty, for that absolutely riveting, fascinating um, story. Uh, I, do, I can't uh, believe that I'm asked to follow that. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, for, fortunately, I've asked myself a different question than the entire rest of the panel, which is, what in the world is the role of the U.S. government in um, uh, religious responses to conflict? And I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk a little bit today about the work of my office, uh, how religion can be a source of solutions to conflicts, and uh, how the U.S. government uh, may or sometimes does engage on this issue. Um, Religious issues are a vital consideration in many aspects of U.S. foreign policy, from the promotion of religious freedom, which is what my office does, to uh, analysis of political and social issues, global se security, conflict resolution, uh, outreach to religious communities. And I would say that uh, in the view of my office, we simply assume that a religious response to conflict can often work. Uh, we don't ask the question of ourselves whether it does or doesn't. We think it probably will, um, in, in large part because religious language provides such a critical lens for interpreting and resolving social conflicts. Even in conflicts with secular origins, where you have a conflict rooted, for instance, in resource distribution, in class, in political access, in globalization trends, <coughs> people are often expressing their conflicting values in religious terms. A society's religious community is often seen as the keeper of its collective identity, its national identity, its history, its memory, and religious communities are often the bellwethers of the larger communal response to conflict. So it's because religion is important to people in so many different ways, personally, socially, culturally, politically, uh, we see that religious leaders or religious motivated indiv religiously motivated individuals have an extraordinary power in these situations and a critical role to play in conflict. As Betty showed, this conflict could be used for good or for ill. You can use it to build relationships <coughs> or exacerbate tensions, to 
unite or divide to further justice or to deny equality. For me, for us at the Department of State, charged with achieving diplomatic solutions to conflicts around the world, religious leaders, religiously motivated peacemakers present for us an opportunity and a challenge. How do we engage? We can engage to magnify the effect of their work. We can attempt to create or to safeguard the conditions they need to do their work. And finally, I think we need to be able to recognize when it's best for us simply to get out of the way and let them do their work. The passage by Congress of the International Religious Freedom Act in 1998, which is commonly called the IRF Act, which established my office, made the promotion of religious freedom a central U.S. policy goal and recognized that religious freedom is a cornerstone for many issues, including security. When we look around the world, we see that the absence of religious freedom can be profoundly destabilizing. Repressing the rights of one group or imposing one religious doctrine on all sows the seeds for fierce political conflict. So we seek to open the political forum to religious thought and discourse, protecting the diversity that makes it more difficult for extremists to corner the market on religion. Evidence indicates that religious affiliation is growing around the world. Sociologist Peter Berger used to declare the waning of religiosity. He now insists that the world today is, and I'll quote him, as furiously religious as it ever was, and in some places more so than ever. Global polling indicates a, a growth in religious affiliation and in the desire of religious leaders to become more involved in politics. <clears throat> and uh, as a former director of my office, Tom Farr, points out, studies in religious demography have indicated that even with conservative estimates of conversions and defections, in 200 years we can still see that 80% of the world's population will continually be affiliated with religious visions of the world. Now, dealing with states that don't respect that and with don't respect freedom of religion prevents very complex tasks for diplomacy. Paul, Paul Marshall of the Hudson Institute recently re released a report on world trends in religious freedom in which he showed that violations of religious freedom worldwide are massive, widespread, and in many parts of the world intensifying. In too many cases, these violations lead to religious believers being imprisoned physically abused or killed simply for the courage of their convictions. What can we do in response to these adversities? Well, the State Department can work both bilaterally and multilaterally, and one of the questions I'm often asked is whether the State Department's commitment to religious freedom is simply an attempt to export an American value. Are we taking simply an American approach to this issue? Well, on the one hand, I'd say that's not a terrible idea. Um, on the other, I must say that we do rely on international standards when we're doing this work. We rely on the Universal Declaration, Declaration of Human Rights. We rely on the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, and on the Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and of Discrimination Based on Religion and Belief. So there are a variety of international instruments that lay out the rights of religious freedom and the rights of people in the world to express their re religiosity. My office, the Office of International Religious Freedom, takes a wide range of activities to promote and to implement U.S. foreign policy on religious freedom. So the experts in my office work either directly on negotiations with foreign officials or in coordination with all of the other bureaus in the State Department and all of the U.S. embassies and consulates abroad to advocate for actions uh, such as legal and policy changes uh, for prisoner releases, reporting and monitoring on the situation of religion around the world, um, or to look for, for technical assistance when it's needed. I would say we're looking for any approach that works, classic or creative. But more broadly in the department, the freedom of, freedom of religion is intricately intertwined with all of the other universal human rights. Freedom of religion encompasses freedom of association, of speech, of assembly, of conscience, all of these rights which together found the, form the foundation for um, respect for the individual, for democratic governance. So as the US government works to protect and promote all of these rights abroad, we recognize that religious leaders, NGOs, religious motivated, uh, peacekeepers are invaluable allies to accomplish those goals. 
when a religiously motivated peacemaker delves into spiritual texts and practices to try to uncover some constructive responses to conflict, constructive responses that draw together people in their own traditions, drawing from empathy, humility, compassion, they can really shape their community's response to a conflict, to strangers, to diversity, to changing circumstances. And when internal enmity and bitterness and suffering threaten to overwhelm the community, religious rituals for healing and forgiveness and reconciliation offer a way forward that is in no way paralleled by dry diplomatic words. Guiding by example, religious leaders can offer the apologies and repentance and restitution needed to restore broken or unjust relationships. And often it is religious leaders responding to their feeling of a higher calling who can expose injustice within societies, promote tolerance, and create the conditions for real healing. Archbishop Desmond Tutu did this in South Africa, highlighting injustice at great personal risk and sacrifice, first in the struggle against apartheid and later facilitating the healing that embraces all sides with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Religious leaders have an important role to play also in condemning terrorism that has torn hundreds of innocent victims of all races and creeds from their families in places around the world. Religious leaders have reached across the boundaries of communities in Israel and in the occupied territories, and I'd like to recognize your peacemaker, Rabbi Menachem Fromen, in that regard. My, of my office also has met very frequently with Canon Andrew White, who David mentioned, the Anglican chaplain in Baghdad, and the head of the Foundation for Reconciliation in the Middle East. <clears throat> he reaches across sectarian lines and works with disparate governments in the region and in the West to look for political, diplomatic, and religious solutions to conflict and tragedy. What is tragic is that his church in Baghdad has lost all of its original leaders to violence, but that church continues to sustain hope and faith. NGOs like the Tannenbaum Center can play a vital role in the U.S. efforts at conflict resolution and post-conflict stabilization. Especially with their access to unofficial actors and institutions, NGOs provide much needed feedback for our diplomatic efforts. And in turn, the State Department often raises local issues at a diplomatic level, advocating for NGOs when local activists' concerns are stymied domestically. We recognize that NGOs, international and local, are essential to the development of a healthy civil society, which is essential to conflict resolution. So the State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development have made capacity building support for local civic activists a mainstay of our foreign assistance. Other State Department programs also support these goals of giving NGOs the foundation they need and the resources they need to engage effectively. Many of the State Department's exchange, study, and visitor programs support advocates of nonviolence and encourage religious dialogue and tolerance. We also offer technical assistance to new democracies who are working on religious issues. Um, in Afghanistan, let me give you one example. The State Department supported a women's radio program uh, to discuss human rights and democratic values within the context of Islam and sponsored a conference focusing on the role of religious leaders in the modernization and development of the country. Probably mainstreaming religious uh, religion at the State Department is one of our biggest challenges, and our office provides a lot of training. We are joined in this goal by the Foreign Service Institute, which uh, has, I'm happy to say, uh, continually tried to update their training and just recently introduced a new course on Islam in Iraq, which um, which brings up issues of regionalism, sectarian loyalty, religious networks, political affiliations, and class. Um, when I look around the world, our U.S. ambassadors have a mandate to promote religious freedom and an urgent need to confront religion wherever they are. And I'm happy to say that as I talk about mainstreaming religious freedom and religion in U.S. foreign policy, that in the past year, U.S. officials up to the very highest levels have engaged extensively in countries where severe violations of religious freedom occur. But the U.S. government's work would be incomplete and misinformed without a close partnership with NGOs, religious groups, and individuals who are committed to defending individual human rights and using religion as a means to solve conflicts. 
So oftentimes these organizations and individuals act at great personal risk, and I just want to take the opportunity to publicly thank them for their contributions. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, all right, uh, please, uh, I think I'll take the liberty of extending our uh, session for 10 minutes or so, so we have a half hour or so for questions, comments, and so on. Um, the floor is open. And I think we'll probably gather a few. Uh, if you could briefly mention who you are, and uh, if you want to ask one particular person or persons, uh, let us know. Yes, Hi, uh, this was fascinating. Thank you all. My name is Mindy Reiser. I'm Vice President of Global Peace Services, an NGO that works in conflict resolution. This is a question to David, although anyone else is free to chime in. You talked about some of the institutional settings that need to be kept in mind, the structures in which people are embedded. And I'd like you to, to think a little bit with us about the role of the military chaplain. And that is not just indigenous to the United States. Many industrial democracies have equivalents to that. And the tensions that that probably generates within religious structures, within groups, within churches and synagogues, and there are now Muslim chaplains as well, in terms of those supporting a, a military confrontation in certain contexts, and those who are looking at resolution of those conflicts. And I think it would be a fascinating study to see how this ripples throughout these institutional structures. And uh, are you aware of any work looking at these tensions? And, and the broader issue, as, as Betty pointed out, that not all religious leaders, probably all, indeed all of them, are not, not saints. They're, they're people of often goodwill, but they're fallible. And she herself saw some of that fallibility. And what happens when the people who are adherents to a certain tradition find betrayal and corruption, what then that does to their religious worship and to their credibility in the institution. Okay, other uh, questions? Yes, sir. Over here, Gregor. Oh. Uh, Father Michael Perry from Catholic Creative Services. Um, this question probably goes to much of what was discussed or part of what was discussed was actual conflict situations ongoing and the way that individuals and groups are uh, brought into action, uh, bring themselves and, and, and other people in context of emerging post-conflict in terms of the what happens to groups, what happens to the cooperation that's taken place. I'm thinking of Aceh and other places. I'm thinking right now of Burundi. Um, hopefully, Betty, very soon for northern Uganda, we pray. Uh, but in, in these contexts, uh, what happens to the, these groups, uh, and, and not only in terms of ongoing collaboration, but their possibility of becoming peace prevention uh, groups to, to, to help mitigate or to help prevent conflict from emerging or re-emerging? I'd just like to hear some of that. I think that might be helpful. Sorry, I may have missed this. Maybe everybody else heard this, but which groups? Um, you mean? Which specific groups? Uh, which, when you say these groups? Uh, talking about religious leaders now. Religious leaders, okay. religious okay. Uh, people who are faith, who are operating out of a religious okay. vision and who are coming together and working. So it could be, it could be religious. It could be the uh, Choli peace leaders. It could be uh, on the interreligious. It could be uh, the what happened in Mozambique, etc. So. Uh, that that's that's a reference. Would you like another? Yes, please. That's we've got two so far. Let's take another one, please. Good afternoon. My name is Clarine Menzies. I work as the domestic program manager for Islamic Relief. We are an international relief and development agency that works in about 35 countries. But my purview is the United States of America. And I'm curious about whether anybody has heard or know of work being done on a religious context to solving any problems in the United States Native American communities. Uh, I haven't heard any of this and we've, um, my organization has just started working with the Native uh, reservations in um, South Dakota and we need any ideas we can get. We're finding a lot in common but it uh, seems like an untried sorts of an alliance between Muslims and Indians, so. 
Yeah, you should publicize that one. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, why, why don't we uh, turn to the panel at this point. David, do you want to start off? Yeah, on the question of military chaplains, there's quite a bit of discussion going on about the role of military chaplains and their roles, potential roles beyond the standard roles of being chaplains to troops and counseling and conducting services and so on. Uh, we have quite a lengthy publication on addressing exactly the issue you're talking about, what role military chaplains can play both as advisors to commanders on religious issues, but reaching out to local religious leaders, understanding the religious context, even possibly playing roles in, in uh, peacemaking in, in situations of religious conflict. Uh, Doug Johnston at the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy has also spoken and written about this subject. So the military is thinking about this very actively. I mean, obviously there are a lot of issues. Um, some chaplains are more, will fall into that role more easily than others. Uh, those that uh, adopt a more inclusivist approach to religious and religion and religion, religious pluralism will feel more comfortable reaching out to local religious leaders if they're of a different faith tradition than, than they are and may be more objective in their assessment of uh, religious situations than those chaplains who may come from a more exclusivist uh, religious orientation. And, so, and their boundary issues. I mean, when do they go beyond what's an appropriate boundary? And when are they seen as suspect because they're representing the military? So there are a lot of issues. But yes, there's a lot of discussion going on within the the military about uh, possible changing roles of chaplains, recognizing the importance of religious, increasing importance of religious issues. Let me add on to that, that my office has had uh, chaplains um, on detail to us uh, in the past few years. Uh, occasionally, we don't have one at the moment, but we are working on getting another chaplain over, and we found that this kind of cross-fertilization is very, very useful. Um, but uh, yes, there are a number of problems, starting with protecting the chaplain's role as someone who is there primarily to minister to the to the to the troops. All right. Mm -hmm. um, the sec oh, do you want to add to that? No, Go ahead. not the second question. The second question of, uh, from Father Perry about the uh, role of groups in ongoing uh, conflict situations, post-conflict uh, work, and so on. Right. Well, I'm. Go ahead. I think okay. it, both of you, but I think he was yeah. looking mainly at Betty, but anybody can answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Betty, you answer. Go ahead. Uh, my frustration is that um, you talked about uh, probably turning the role into conflict <coughs> prevention, yeah? Uh, the frustration I see around the world is that there is general reluctance to invest in prevention of conflict. We always move in, or members of the international community move in after war has broken out. And, um, uh, and usually, everybody knows a problem is coming. The, currently, we have probably there are about 30 countries in conflict around the world. And usually, this is predicted. The NGOs will tell you what the problems are. They tell you it's going to come, but um, uh, nobody wants to do anything about it. I'll tell you one experience I've had recently. Looking at a country, I will not mention that country, but I was asked to evaluate our performance of UNDP. And one of the problems that I did, I, because I led uh, a team of consultants, one of the problems I was able to see that this, the, it, may not, it may be 10 years or even 15 years, but it's very, it's the, the, the uh, indicators are all there. That country is drifting slowly into war. But UNDP does not want that pointed out because it will jeopardize their relationship with that country. So you can see that uh, this is something that has to be addressed. How can the international community uh, you, try to work hard at approach to, to prevent conflict. Now, 
again, I'm giving a different situation. Um, uh, it, it, regarding these groups, the other thing I've seen around peace, peace talks and subsequent uh, peace agreements is that the moment peace agreement is signed, there's fatigue. Everybody walks away. Uh, there's very little guarantee that it will, you know, that somebody from the international community will remain to guarantee, to monitor that what has been agreed upon is implemented. Uh, and so when you have religious leaders that have been working together, funding dries up so that they can no longer have an office, they can no longer, you know, they simply are not facilitated to continue with the work because reconciliation is a long, it's a process. It's not something that happens overnight. Uh, so that, you know, that forgiveness, that uh, people to learn to live together um, can actually be affected over a period of time, this usually dries up. But to even make it worse, when um, in post-conflict situations, whether it's bilaterals, development partners, World Bank, UN, they do not want, to, they come in with good projects, but they do not supplement what the local communities have been doing. They come and initiate the completely different project Instead of trying to understand where can we intervene, how can we support these uh, activities that have been going on during conflict, uh, whether it's women groups, whether it's religious groups, usually that's not. The World Bank will come with its own program, totally ignoring what has been going on over the years, which possibly supported and helped people to get to where they are. So will uh, USID. <laughs> so you know this. This is unfortunate. So I put the same the, in the same category. We have religious leaders. Somehow this there it dissipates in the air. Maybe Tannenbaum can help to continue. Actually, um, I will speak about some of our experience with some of the peacemakers, and I'll start with Friar Evo, where we were in Sarajevo. Um, He's been working post-conflict, and what he did during the war, uh, but what he did before the war, he, you know, among many things, in, in, including being in a parish, he, um, he, he was a, virtually a concert pianist, you know, a, a, a remarkable musician with a great intellect and a love of music. Um, post-conflict, he's doing a lot of different work, but one of the things he's done is create, he's created an interfaith um, International Choir Uchi Uchi, which has gone around the world, but we stayed with him and uh, after our retreat for an extra day to go to Shevrenitsa um, with the choir, and he asked us to come, because, uh, and we saw them in action with the children there, and it was an act of healing that he was working on and sharing with them how people from a range of different religious traditions could make music together about religious traditions from religious traditions and it was all beautiful and the children participated in each and it was very interactive and 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 very moving and uh, the children there who came were hungry and part of this was to feed them as well um so he is still doing that work part of the reason he wanted Tannenbaum and the peacemakers to convene in Sarajevo was because of the power of the presence of these uh, individual religious leaders from diverse religious traditions from all over the globe coming together. And we met with the presidency. Um, in fact, the presidency gave out the award to Betty and to our other peacemakers. Um, publicly, but we also met with them privately. We met with the local community leaders uh, in Sarajevo. We went to Mostor and met with leadership there. And it, for him, uh, part of what that meant was that the local, that, that religious leaders were necessary partners in stabilizing the community. And that was part of the message that he was help, using us to give and that we were working to give. And I think it was effective, and he says it was effective. And that helped him in his work as he continues to work behind the scenes, 
on one level and then also with the music in another, always trying to bring people together. So he is doing post-conflict work in a different way than he was during the conflict. Um, the other thing that you said about the fatigue, which I think is very interesting, is one of the things that was said at one of our retreats by our peacemaker from Sierra Leone, uh, Al Alamami Karoma, was when the UN left, we stayed. And that's why the people trust us, because we stay with the people. And we're still part of the community. And that's why we can work with them. And it does go to the local projects on the ground and what is happening and the need not to always come in from the top and do something, but to find out what's happening and working and who these peacemakers are, these religious peacemakers, because they're everywhere. They just need to be identified. Um, one other quick example post-conflict uh, in Northern Ireland. I had a very interesting experience just last week, actually. Um, our peacemakers, um, one of them, um, Father Alec Reed, was worked behind the scenes with the um, paramilitaries, the IRA, uh, to get the ceasefire. Um, he's not working anymore in Northern Ireland. He's working in the Basque countries, and he was the person behind the scenes when there was the recent ceasefire that didn't last. But it's the same person still doing peacemaking work. But there are religious peacemakers in Northern Ireland, and last week I got a call from someone who was coming in from Belfast, um, and he's doing the post-conflict work. And he said, and he knew about our religious peacemakers, and he said, you know, he wants to take the education programs that we have. We have a cooperative program in, in D.C., actually, um, with fourth graders uh, from a Catholic school and a Jewish day school. It's an academic program where the kids work together uh, around uh, coexistence issues and uh, through, through the medium of the Olympics. And he wants to take that model, train the educators in different schools where the tensions are still very, very raw, and implement that model in Belfast. And he has the connections to do it. So we're now looking at how to make that happen. So I think that the post-conflict work on the ground by religious peacemakers, when you find them, I, don't, I think the, they may be tired, but they keep going. And I think every one of our peacemakers, in one way or another, is still working for Mark, right? They're still, still working for peace, in one way or another. And some of them have changed the way they're doing it. It's not always the same. But they all keep going, conflict or post-conflict. All right, the, the third question from the lady who was asking about uh, if any of us have heard of any work um, dealing with a Native Amer the Native American community um, for her own uh, organization's uh, uh, ideas and strategy. Can anyone feel that one? Um, I, I actually can Good. give you <laughs> <laughs> to show you my unbelievable uh, diversity. Um, when I was young, I actually did work on a, a Navajo reservation um, in a religious context, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it afterward and give you some details on where you can find those folks. Okay. Uh, this gentleman here, please. Thank you. I'm Don Wolfensberger with the uh, Congress Project here at the Wilson Center. This is uh, directed at Betty, but perhaps the others of you have experience with this too. And I'm wondering about the limits of um, religious leadership intervention in certain situations. And I'm thinking specifically in terms of the Lord's uh, Resistance Army, where to me it sounds like you have a cult. The leader speaks directly with God, the followers follow, and so on. So this is not a traditional uh, religious group by any means. And I'm wondering to what extent religious leaders can have leverage, leverage you know, with that type of group. I mean, that's the lone holdout. I think you were successful with the other groups in bringing them to the, the peace table, as I understand from what I've heard you, you say. But uh, I'm just wondering if there is a certain limitation on, let's say, traditional religious leaders being able to intervene in situations where uh, this particular group doesn't agree with those religious leaders as to what the, what the real word is. Uh, thank you. Any other uh, questions before we turn to that one? This one right there. Oh. oh, yes, in the back, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Randall Spadoni with World Vision. Uh, World Vision is a faith-based uh, international relief and development organization, and we work in a lot of contexts where there's, there's a tension that you can feel between justice and peace. 
and uh, I, I personally work with uh, Burma and North Korea and uh, and must work with governments that I know are complicit with um, with injustice and uh, I'm wondering there's a question for Betty that anyone can answer um, as a as a person of faith how do you um, reconcile this desire for peace with the desire for justice um, do you have to uh, turn a blind eye to one for the sake of another, or is there some sense of harmony that you can have, you know, for example, when you're negotiating with these, these rebel leaders? Thank you. All right, let's, uh, let's take those two questions, and it seems as if Betty is the main uh, target for both of them, <laughs> uh, but please, uh, everyone, uh, feel free to uh, join in after Betty. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, the first question about uh, let me just understand the question well. Is what the religious leaders are doing about the Lord's Resistance Army? Um, back in the 90s when I was there, actually, to me, the challenge was, uh, this is about religion. So you have to stand up and condemn it. Uh, but again, as I said in here, sometimes we think they can do anything. They decided not to be reckless and not to condemn it because they would be become easy they would become easy targets for LR for the Lord's resistance army. So it brought such confusion to a point that even some religious leaders were found they provided them with gowns, uh, provided them with food and drugs and uh, so just a situation during conflict causes so much confusion that um, a lot of people lose their ways. Uh, and as I said earlier on, the first time that Joseph Coyne allowed me to go and meet with him face to face and start off the peace talks, as I debated within myself as to who I could take without risking their lives too much, because I knew I could run, but I wasn't sure anybody else I took would be able to run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so eventually I thought, well, let me take religious leaders. It would be difficult. And again, their being human beings <laughs> prevailed to a point that they really could not um, uh, go, with, go with me. And also what I've seen is these trading on various, uh, that they feel they're trading on soft grounds. Don't condemn the Lord's resistance army. Talk nicely. Maybe that can act as a pull factor woo them to come out, uh, talk about there's not going to be any revenge, you're going to be forgiven, without necessarily consulting victims, whether, mm -hmm. you know, this is what victims really want to see happen. So, uh, but I'm, I'm saying this, that it's not that they have not performed. Actually, religious leaders have been recognized, they've done some really good things, but there's also confusion from time to time. Uh, but that is all the result of war, that uh, people get totally confused and they do not even know what or who they are and what they want sometimes. David? Uh, Betty has been my tutor on the Lord's Resistance Army and persuaded me to go to Juba last month to observe the uh, peace negotiations between the Uganda government and the LRA. In response to your question about it being a cult, yes, it is a cult, and with most cults, uh, other religious leaders can't really have much influence because the cult leader has a direct line to God, and that word prevails over any other interpretation, which of necessity is a false interpretation if it disagrees with what my line with God uh, dictates that I should do. So it, they are the other religious leaders are very limited in what they can in what they can do. Betty at one point asked me to try to uh, develop some guidelines from a Christian perspective on how the Lord's Resistance Army, which uh, says it's being guided by the Ten Commandments, how it violates the Ten Commandments at every turn. <laughs> and uh, I dutifully followed her request and, and tried to lay out a Christian traditional Christian perspectives on peace and the Ten Commandments, but uh, didn't carry a lot of weight with the LRA. <laughs> the question about the trade-off between peace and justice, this is the classic dilemma 
of peacemakers. And this is handled in different ways in different places. In Angola, the end of the Civil War there, there was a blanket amnesty. Um, I mean, you just cringe when uh, there are blanket amnesties for people who've committed such atrocities. Sitting there at the negotiating uh, room in, in Juba and, and thinking about what might happen to Kony and his top military commanders uh, with the LRA delegation arguing that there should be amnesty for them. Uh, you just can't tolerate that. On the other hand, you could have peace in a minute if you told Kony, uh, here's $300,000, go settle and buy yourself a villa and, and live comfortably in, in Uganda. But that's not, that's not tolerable. But these trade-offs, every situation is handled differently. I mean, the South African situation was kind of a hybrid uh, between the trade-offs between uh, amnesty and, and, and justice. But uh, there are no simple answers, and the human rights community will argue with the peacemakers. And um, th there can be a lot more enlightenment on this subject, but you're not going to get an e easy resolution of it. Um, I think what you're asking is what has sparked off a lot of debate, that is the arrest warrant that has been issued by the International Criminal Court, whereby many Ugandans are quoted to have said, we don't want the arrest warrant, we're going to use traditional uh, system of justice, uh, we will forgive them, uh, we don't like ICC. Uh, I think that's your, basically that's what you're driving at. Um, or should we have, uh, uh, is justice an obstacle to peace? This is part of a lot of debate around, ar around the world. Uh, but I want to present it from the perspective of some of the victims that have had long discussions with them. Uh, because I think all of us can talk and will be very academic about this issue. But it is how do victims feel about this? So to jump to the end of what I would answer personally, what I have observed is that if there is no justice in the long run, it will be very difficult to reconcile people. Uh, secondly, if there is no justice, a lot of victims are ready to pick up arms and, fight and, uh, and, um, and revenge. Uh, in fact, from the victims, uh, some of the victims are saying that, uh, you know, peace, we want peace desperately. And we know out of this agreement, Kony is going to be uh, given maybe a job, a house, a car. He's going to be rewarded for what he has done to us. And we victims will remain poor, having lost all our loved ones. A woman who was brutally hurt told me, said, you know, I still have two sons. They will revenge if nothing happens. So I kind of went to, to, to the end tale of, of the story. Um, I think a lot, of just, uh, a lot of victims, what they're saying is, let's have this sequenced. Let's have peace first. Because what LRA is now demanding that before the peace agreement is signed, uh, end of this month, the arrest warrant must be dropped. Otherwise, there's no signing of the peace agreement. They take, they've take, they're taking advantage of that, making ICC a scapegoat. The government is saying, OK, sign the agreement. Then we can consider going to ICC and the UN Security Council. So at the moment, things are between uh, those two. Now, so the victims are saying, Shh, let's keep quiet about the arrest warrant. We want them to come out. And then uh, justice uh, has to prevail. So the demand that, oh, we'll forgive them, or oh, statements that we can reconcile, we can use the traditional system of justice, is very much driven by quest for peace. Now, the moment there's peace, people are going to demand justice. So uh, it is not either or. I think they have to work together, but has to be sequenced. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, 
This certainly has uh, provided a rich set of answers to our basic question. I think uh, if I may again uh, quote uh, uh, a text, uh, in this case the New Testament, apologies to all of those who are not of that faith. Um, our discussion supports two notions, uh, two passages. Blessed are the peacemakers, uh, but also by their fruits ye shall know them.